Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're going to be reading about measuring developer productivity. Now this is coming from the pr Pragmatic Engineer, uh, which is a newsletter that I subscribe to and follow. This is a free issue, so you should be able to go and see it. Not sponsored, but I really love this newsletter. Really great in-depth reporting on tech issues and like investigations um, and all sorts of stuff. And so when I saw he put this out and it's kind of about how do we measure things and how do we do like info organizational measurement for software engineering. I really wanted to read what he was talking about. Um, it's something I think about a lot. I don't have a perfect answer yet, um, but I think this is really important and something that's like not done well in the industry today. So I think this is a great article. Um, hope you enjoy it. It is a little bit long, so, you know, just be warned. Oh yeah, and as always, I'll have the link to this uh, in the description. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the intro to this, uh, but basically McKinsey, the consulting company, put out this like press release thing saying that they were gonna show how to do developer productivity and a bunch of like, people who are actually engineers, been in the industry for a while. Uh, he mentions Kent Beck, who is the creator of Extreme Programming, basically hated this. And they didn't know why they hated this, but they knew they hated it. So they kind of got together to publish um, a dual blog post. So now let's jump down to where the article actually began. So what happens when you start to measure things? Kent Beck worked at Facebook for seven years, uh, now Meta, and has firsthand experience on a similar situation, as he shared. At Facebook, we instituted the sorts of surveys McKinsey recommends. That was good for about a year. The surveys provided valuable feedback about the current state of developer sentiment. Then folks decided that they wanted to make the survey results more legible so they could track trends over time. They computed an overall score from the survey. Very reasonable thing to do. That was good for another year. A four and a half became a four. What happened? Then those scores started cropping up in performance reviews, just as a, and they are doing such a good job that their score is 4.5. That was a good for another year. Then those scores started getting rolled up. A manager's score was the average of their report scores. A director's score would be the average of their reporting manager scores. Now things started getting under unhinged. Directors put pressure on managers for better scores. Managers started negotiating with individual contributors for better survey scores. Give me a five and I'll make sure you get an exceeds expectations. Directors started cutting managers and teams with poor scores, whether those cuts made organizational sense or not. Yeah, I will say from uh, working at Meta from three-ish years, you know, we had this big emphasis on impact. Like everything had to be quantifiable and go to an impact. Um, and I think they actually did this really well. And this is what has led them to do so well as a large corporation is they allow a lot of autonomy and they have a lot of measurements of impact and you're able to kind of quantify this and prove that what you did did these results. And I think this is important here because this is kind of showing us that whatever incentive structure you create, um, that thing will be gamed in some way. So you have to be very careful about like, how do the incentives I set out produce behavior? And is that actually getting you to the impact or the outcomes that I actually want? Or is this incentives going to be self-destructive. And here looking at these numbers in total, it feels like it was self-destructive. Let's keep reading. Things went from, we'd like to know how things are going to, we know even less about how things are going, but they are definitely going worse because people are now gaming the system. Note, this will always occur. Whatever system you create, people will try to game it. So you need to make sure that the game is something you want them to play. How did this occur? Well, because we started to measure and incentivize with money and status changes in the measures and measuring leads to behavior change, behavior change, including coming up with creative ways to improve those measurement scores, even at the expense of results that everyone agrees matter. And this is actually one of the reasons why I think like the simple idea that Meta had, like focus on impact is so important because yes, you want your measures for anything, but by going back to the idea behind focus on impact, which is like the actual outcome, you can pretty quickly shut down people that are just showing you these measures that like, hey, I increased this thing by 10x, but it's like, did that matter? Um, and so it's kind of a dual purpose like pinpoint for whether the measure that you use to measure impact was actually impactful or not. And so in my experience, you can often prevent people from doing this gamification because you're like, cool, high numbers, high score, uh, but we're not going to give you anything for that because it, it didn't actually mean anything. All right. So in this two-part article, we seek to arm engineering leaders with perspectives to the question, can you measure developer productivity? It's a sum of our viewpoints, professional experiences, and what we've seen work firsthand. Kent Beck brings 40 years of software engineering experience and has tried failed and tried again to measure developer productivity for almost all this time. I really don't know how to say his name, Gurgly. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Sorry if I'm not. Brings 15 years of software engineering experience, including five years managing engineering. Two weeks ago, McKinsey published the article, Yes, You Can Measure Software Developer Productivity. In it, the company claimed it has an approach for measuring software developer productivity that nearly 20 companies already use, and that the consultancy is ready to extend the rollout of the custom approach. As tempting as it is, we won't go into a detailed critique of the McKinsey article and the measurement methodology 
strategy, the thinking that's evident in this article is absurdly naive and ignores the dynamics of high performing software engineering teams, which I'm honestly not surprised about. I will say that most software engineering teams are not high performing. Um, so this kind of like regression to the mean for like most companies is actually relatively common and a lot of quote unquote best practices, uh, but I digress. But it was written for a reason. CEOs and CFOs are increasingly frustrated by CTOs throwing up their hands and saying software engineering is too nuanced to measure. When sales teams have individual measurements and quotas to hit, as do recruitment teams and the number of positions to fill. The executive reasoning goes, if other groups can measure individual performance, it's absurd that engineering cannot. Yep, yes and no. I think we'll get into this further later in the article. The reality is engineering leaders cannot avoid the question of how to measure developer productivity today. If they try to, they risk the CEO or CFO turning instead to McKinsey, obviously the, the evil ones in this article, uh, who will bring their custom framework, deploy it even as the CTO protests and start reporting on custom McKinsey metrics like developer velocity benchmark index, contribution analysis, and talent capability. Yeah, we actually had this cool tool at Meta that like aggregated a lot of data about like what engineers were doing, like how many comments did you put on PRs? How many PRs did you participate in? How many like lines did you change and stuff? And I don't think it was used very heavily in performance reviews or something, unless you're one of the archetypes that they call like code machines, where it's like the reason you stand out is because you push so much code. But for the most part, like me, like I push out probably a below average amount of code. Um, it, it did never really hurt me because it was all about like impact. I'm um, like, what was the outcome of the code that you pushed? Um, and the reason that you really can't focus on things like this, like contribution analysis, like what number of things did you do is because I could do an infinite amount of things and produce zero impact, you know? Like I could spend infinite hours sitting at my computer desk and scrolling through Slack, but that's like absolutely useless. And yet I actually see this like all the time in startups and tools and like Jira and, and stuff trying to like give you a burn down of how everyone's doing, but it's just, it's totally useless. Whenever I see, I'll, I'll even go further and say, whenever I see a team that uses this for anything other than like just a one-off like check or just interest, I'm I'm like, this team is broken. They're, they're fundamentally not focused on impact and not focused on the value stream of like why they should exist. Okay, and rent. We believe that introducing such a framework is wrongheaded and certain to backfire. The McKinsey framework will almost, will most likely do far more harm than good to organizations and to the engineering culture at companies. Such damage could take years to undo. So let's get around to answering this question without evasion and give demanding CEOs and CFOs what they want. This is one thing I really love about the culture and engineering in general is like people see something wrong. They're very um, incentivized and like it's very common for them to like just share their feedback. And I think it actually leads to a much tighter like improvement loop and, and stops a lot of dumb things from happening. So in this article, we're going to cover a mental model of the software engineering cycle. Where does the need for measuring productive productivity come from? how to sales and recruitment measure productivity so accurately, measurement trade-offs and software engineering. And part two, I might have to read this later, uh, checking these other things as well. Who is this article for? We wrote this article for software developers and engineering leaders and anybody who cares about nurturing high performing software development team, AKA actually building decent quality software with decent timelines. By high performing, I mean teams where developers satisfy their customers, feel good about coming to work and don't feel like they're constantly measured on senseless metrics, which work against building software that solves customers problems and wow does this happen in most companies and teams our goal is to help hands-on leaders to make suggestions for measuring without causing harm and to help software developers become more productive when reading articles like McKinsey's keep in mind that they're written for a very different and specific audience untechnical CEOs and CFOs with little to zero experience with software development engineering is just another department they need to treat engineering the same way they treat sales or recruitment and will do so regardless of the damage misconceived frameworks due to development development culture. A mental model of the software engineering cycle. Before we jump to our solution, let's set some context. How does software engineering create value? Take the typical example of building a feature, then launching it to customers and iterating on it. What does this cycle look like? Say we're talking about a pretty autonomous and empowered software engineering team working at a startup who are in tune with customers. All right, so they spot a customer pain point and brainstorm how to solve it. They make a plan, they write the code and ship it. I think this is probably wrong. I think there's too many steps here. A design docs, code code written, the feature in production, customers behave differently, value generated through this change. Okay, so like they observed something, they designed the thing and made the thing. I, I think these ones down here shouldn't be here. Uh, and then the customers see the feature, so they're like behaving differently. And then that is leading to whatever outcome that happens. Like customers click more things, maybe revenue goes up, or maybe the app crashes and it's like goes down. Okay, we start by deciding what to do next, and then we do it. This is the effort, like planning, coding, and so 
on. Maybe. Uh, through this effort, we produce tangible things like the feature itself, the code design documents, etc. Hmm, maybe. These are the output. Okay. Customers will behave differently as a result of this output, which is our outcome. For example, thanks to the feature, they might get stuck less during the onboarding flow. As a result of this behavior change, we will see the value flowing back to us like feedback, revenue, referrals. This is impact. So, all right, you put an effort, get some, you, mm, you create some output, then you get an outcome and then this is impact. Okay, I, I kind of agree. I usually think of this a little bit differently. Okay, let's draw this real fast. Okay, this is how I actually view all acts of creation, including software engineering, which I think is a, a better model for this, though I mostly agree. Um, so first you've got observe, then you've got create, and then you've got uh, reflect. And this is what I call the creation cycle. I think all creation goes through this, these three steps. Um, and if you're not going through these three steps, you should think about it because you probably should be going through them. Um, and so the observe step is kind of what he has as like effort there, but I, I don't think effort's the right word for this. What you're doing is you need to understand something about the world. You observed a problem, an opportunity, you brainstormed a solution. Um, this is the observe step. Then you get to the create step. And that's when you're like, okay, based on all this like raw knowledge I have, um, these data points, these ideas in my head, I'm gonna create a design. I'm going to code the thing, or if you're like a writer, write the thing, or if you're like a painter, paint the thing. And that's the create step. And then, and then I guess what, you know, in intuitively happens from there is this, this produces some sort of like outcome, right? Like you created something, this is your act. And then this is what you created. This is like the artifact, like what, what was the outcome of that creation? And this is what he's talking about as like the outcome is this thing that's put out in the world. And then when the humans interact with it, this eventually turns into uh, like the impact because you created a change and thus, oh gosh, I don't know what's going on here. How do I stop that? You get the idea. The the impact is here um, because people start interacting with the artifact or the change in the world and that that's the actual impact. Um, and then after that, what you, what you should do is like, you should look at the artifact, you should see the impact that occurred and then you reflect on your cycle, what could have gone better? And then this is how you get like the endless loop of creation, the creation cycle, as I call it. And I think this is a better model of what the actual software engineering or any kind of creation cycle is, but close enough to this to kind of understand, I would just say that this isn't necessarily the loop. Um, and I would say this is observe, create, this is your artifact, and then it produces impact. Also, if you've seen other loops like this, like the learn, uh, or sorry, the build, measure, learn loop is kind of like this from like the lean startup and stuff. Uh, you'll see a lot of these loops in nature because this is kind of what every, every cycle ends up as, but I call it the creation cycle, observe, create, reflect. Okay, anyway, the effort output outcome impact model describes software engineering and works just as well for smaller tasks as it does to model thinking about feature development or shipping complex projects. Yeah, and I think this is true. Again, I would say the creation cycle, but one of the things I love about it is no matter if you're fixing a bug or writing a feature or doing like a two year long project, like it's all needs those three steps. You need the observe step to understand what's going on, the create step to actually build the artifact, and then the reflect step to really understand what the impact was of that artifact and understand how you can do better in the future. Okay, we reference this model throughout the article. Where does the need for measuring productivity come from? Before we answer how to measure, let's start with the more important question. Who wants to measure productivity and why? This is such an important question to start with. The answer will differ dramatically depending on who's asking and what the goal of the question is. Here's a few common examples. Number one, a CTO who wants to identify which engineers to fire. How can I measure the productivity of engineers in the organization to identify the least productive 10% and let them go. Unfortunately, this case is timely in the wake of recent layoffs across the tech industry. Here are some ways to answer it. Identify the lowest performers based on the latest performance review scores. This approach uses historical data that is likely somewhat outdated. Yeah, but I would say, you know, most review scores are like over a six month period. So yes, outdated, but like this was their level across six months. So not, not a terrible understanding of what they did across a significant portion of time. But again, I, I guess it, it depends on how they're reviewing. Are, are these reviews actually good or not? I don't know. Let, let's see what else he says. Decide based on tenure and layoff based on the last and first out method. This uses no performance related data and simply assumes that the exit of recent joiners will affect productivity less. Yeah, you could do this though. Actually, when I look at layoffs, usually it's like a first in first out because those people that came in early 
earlier? Well, well, I guess it depends. I will say that a lot of organizations, the later people that come in, their salaries are higher. Um, but the earlier people that were there have higher options packages uh, or like equity investments. So I think it depends. Oftentimes they'll they'll take like the higher earners uh, who are just getting reasonable performance and they, they seem to cut them. But yeah, that's, that's also, also a way to do it. Decide on a few easy to measure metrics like the number of pull requests, number of tickets closed and so on. Basically to decide by effort and output. And yeah, I already talked about how this kind of goes sideways because you can always game this number and it doesn't actually mean anything. It doesn't actually lead to impact. Um, ask managers to identify the number of engineers to be let go. This approach can harness team dynamics and unquantifiable information like a manager knowing which engineers are about to hand in their resignation, which quantitative metrics miss. I do think this is pretty good and nice, um, nicer like to most individuals, but I bet organizationally this isn't optimal for like saving the most money if you're in the case of like a layoff and need to save money. With layoffs, team dynamics are impacted and any approach which fails to take this into account is likely to result in a less than ideal outcome. At the same time, layoffs often come with constraints like senior leadership not wanting to get line managers involved. As a result, decisions are often made based on metrics known to be in. Yeah, team dynamics are always impacted. I was, you know, sitting through the, the meta layoffs in, in 2022 and I ended up wanting to leave um, myself. But one of the weirdest, hardest things is like you didn't know who was going to get laid off. And we, in fact, saw a lot of like super well-regarded, good at their job engineers get laid off and a kind of like random decimation of like, we're just taking this percent and just cutting you, which on the one hand seems like relatively fair because it, it almost feels like just a random chance that you get chosen. But from like a personal standpoint, it's like, oh man, some of the people that got cut were like, you didn't deserve that. Um, although that doesn't really matter during layoffs. Um, but that really hurt team dynamics. And I would say hurt morale quite a bit over that time. Okay, number two, to compare two investment opportunities. How can I measure the productivity of teams and allocate additional headcount to the team that will make the most efficient use of additional headcount? To answer this question, you want to compare the return on investment. This is not a question about productivity. It's about the impact of allocating more headcount to one team or another. I actually like this one overall, um, looking on ROI, but it needs to be both ways because it can't only be backwards looking um, because just because a team failed to get ROI or got a lot of ROI last half doesn't mean they have it next half. But you also need to take into account the past signals for like what they plan on doing next half. Like if they're saying they're going to get all these wins, but they've gotten no wins in the past like two halves, it's like, I don't know if I believe you. Um, but I do like this ROI approach and, and think most teams should be planning this way. And if they're not thinking about ROI, like they don't understand impact and therefore they're probably not an efficient software engineering team. Okay, number three, to manage performance, how can I measure engineers productivity to identify and reward the top 10% and to identify identify the bottom quarter in order to debug and improve their performance. There are plenty of ways to go about measuring performance and doing so with metrics as possible, though error prone. A hands-on manager can immediately name their bottom and top performers and then examine and debug outputs and look closer at how engineers do their work. Their effort. performance calibrations are a standard way to do this. I do think calibrations across any kind of like um, metric thing is necessary because there's just always going to be differences in like populations and stuff um, between different orgs and things like that. Like some orgs will just be like super technical, um, but they, they might not be very impact focused. Um, and other orgs might be super like product driven. So very impact focused, but not very technical. And so the ratings are naturally going to be different based on what they did. And so you need to calibrate them across these like local, I don't know, foci to like understand whether these measurements actually make sense um, in the broader scheme of things. Number four, a software engineer who wants to grow at their craft. The question could be, how can I measure my own productivity and which metrics can I improve to become a better engineer? This is a question more engineers should ask of themselves. Here are two help approaches. Aim to only have one red test at a time when using test-driven development. This approach measures both effort and output. Get to the point where you can confidently, deliberately, and consistently have one red test when you expect one red test. Set a goal to merge a pull request every day and track this goal over a week. This measure includes both effort and output. This goal forces you to do smaller commits, which are easier to review and get signed off quicker. It also pushes you to write code that's correct and follow team standards. Standard. As long as you keep tracking these scores and work on improving them, you'll almost certainly improve your efficiency as a software engineer. But what would happen if you showed these metrics to your manager and your performance was then judged by them? It would be a disaster. You'd be measured not on outcomes or impact, but by output. When you experiment with approaches, for example, learning a new language to help a team in need, then your output could drop even though you're helping the team achieve a better outcome. Yeah, this is a good point. I mean, I think these are a little too like specific for what we're talking about here. And I don't know if I like totally approve of them, but I, I do agree with this kind of idea of like the problem 
problems with these like systems thinking like I'm, I'm a big fan of atomic habits and like building systems for yourself but like you know the same thing of like just measuring output it doesn't make sense because I can be super efficient at doing something but that something just might not be useful so it's like uh who cares <laughs> you know like I'm super efficient at folding socks but like it doesn't actually like okay who cares I'm sorry I always think there's like this this push and pull between like the impact you're trying to achieve and the systems you need to set up to achieve them and they need to be constantly like balancing each other there's like that old classic saying it's like like to a ship that doesn't have like a direction that it's trying to go then no wind is favorable and I think that's very true like you need both the place you're going and a way to get there and you need to constantly be checking that they're kind of like make sense with each other TDD I think good practice most people should do this to some extent just to prove that the thing you're doing but the whole like one red test all the time I don't know that's a little bit too um, prescriptive um, and the set a goal to merge a request every day I think a better way to think about this is every week you should have like three things that you're trying to accomplish like three milestones or something that move your your actual projects forward and then within that week you need to do whatever you can to make sure you have those those impact targets and so this might mean you need multiple pull requests in a day you might need multiple things but I do think this idea of like every unit of time you should like get an impact done is better than saying just like make a code change every day so that that's probably what I would recommend if people are looking for a way to, to improve okay why can sales and recruitment measure productivity so accurately or can they as a software engineering industry we should collectively admit we've done a much worse job of measuring productivity down to the individual level than other functions have take sales as an example here is Kent's account of the level of accountability sales operates at from a meeting of sales and engineering leadership at one of his past companies. I clearly remember this meeting where it was engineering and sales leadership reporting on progress. Each person from the sales team spoke and gave an update which went something like, my team's target for the quarter was $600,000 and we delivered 520. I take accountability for the miss. Here are the reasons it happened and here is my plan of what I'm changing to hit next quarter's goal of 650. Additionally, here is a two quarter long initiative I'm putting in place which I expect will bring in an incremental 100k for each quarter once complete. Any questions? If anyone had questions the sales leader would drill down all the way to the individual level which sales reps were above quota and which were below it and by how much and do so in a way that everyone in the room understood and then it was engineering's turn my goodness the contrast was stark the typical engineering update went something like this so this quarter we shipped feature a and we are slightly behind on some tech debt migrations and next quarter we'll ship feature b and catch up on the migration any questions if anyone had questions about some delay the answer was never about individuals as with sales and usually included factors like unforeseen difficulties tech debt, APIs, all things which non-engineers in the room didn't really understand. Yep, that, that definitely checks out. I will say you can't let engineering get away with this because there's infinite like problems. So, you know, in the same way, like you shouldn't measure on output, you also like, you can't just let them like not have any uh, timelines or, or this will always be the case. The level of accountability which sales and customer support work with is on a completely different scale from what a CEO observes from engineering. But when the CEO examines overall departmental costs, engineering probably costs more than sales. It's not just sales that demonstrates higher levels of accountability. Recruiting teams have targets for heads to fill. A recruiting team can, without hesitation, answer the question of what percentage of their targets have been met, how many more recruiters they need to meet aggressive hiring targets, and to identify the top and the bottom recruiters purely based on metrics. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a CEO. Sales has ways to clearly measure productivity, as does recruitment. So why not engineering? Let's return to our effort, output, outcome, impact, mental model, gosh, creation cycle, sounds so much better than this, uh, of how software engineering works. We can apply this model to sales and recruitment. The sales team measures itself by deals closed. So where does this metric go in the model? It falls into outcome or impact. Okay, so the effort that they're doing is like collecting leads, getting meetings with people, tailoring quotes to companies, I guess, and then following up to like, I guess, get them on a call or something. Um, the output of this is their emails, the quotes that they send out, the contract drafts that they have. And then the outcome of all this stuff is like the number of deals closed, the number of deals pending, and the total number of or total dollars of closed deals, which then leads to impact, which is the percent of the target that was hit for their, I guess, themselves or their, their area. Okay, I, I buy that. What about the recruitment team's main metric, the number of heads filled? It's also categorized as impact. So their effort is sourcing candidates, running referral programs, probably, you know, landing in your LinkedIn inbox, uh, sifting through all the inbound applications, and then coordinating, yeah, the interviews with those people to make sure that they're, you know, actually getting in the door. Then the output is, Okay, actually doing the jobs, sending rejection emails. Yeah, these these are too close to me, um, but sure. Uh, they do some things and then that leads to
to outcomes, which is the number of job offers made, the number of rejections. And so you have these like core metrics, the percentage of things, people that they close, the number of heads that each individual hits. And then that leads to the impact, which is the percent of the heads that they needed versus, you know, was actually, okay, it makes sense, I guess. We can repeat this exercise for other functions with high accountability and how they work. For example, customer support can be measured by the number of tickets closed, an outcome, the time it takes to close a ticket, also an outcome, and by customer satisfaction scores. Impact. And maybe th these things are always gamed and don't really mean anything. It's usually like good or bad. Um, neither Kent nor I have seen accountable teams within tech companies, which are not measured by outcome and impact. In order to make software engineering more accountable, we need to look at how to do this. Yep, I totally agree it should be impact. Um, outcome, maybe. Uh, I'm still not sure how, how different that is. Measurement trade-offs in software engineering. One popular framework to measure software engineering team efficiency is the DORA framework. Let's map out the focus of this framework measurement. So you got your effort, your output, and then it's focused on outcome, which is deployment frequency, lead time for changes, mean time to recover, change failure rate. I mean, none of these make any sense. Deployment frequency doesn't matter. I mean, you, you should be deploying multiple times a day, but like uh, that doesn't seem like something you should be measuring. Lead time for changes, it's gonna depend per change. So doesn't seem like it's that useful. Mean time to recover. This does seem useful, but like you can't just take time out of, out of context. Like if the problem is like we misspelled something on the main page for an hour, that's much different than like the sign is down for, or the site is down for an hour. So like it needs to be impact. I don't, I don't like these. Change failure rate. Mm, yeah, it, it depends on the actual failure. I, I don't know if I like any of these. Okay, all Dora metrics measure outcomes or impact. Let's look at another way to measure developer productivity, the space framework. It seeks to capture satisfaction, performance, activity, communication, and efficiency. Space. Okay. It's not only outcomes and impact as with Dora, the space framework does not outline de definite metrics, but gives example ones. Several of the metrics come with a warning, like measuring lines of code. Yeah, definitely shouldn't do that. Too easy to game, totally meaningless. And honestly, the best code usually has average levels of code. It's not the smallest or the largest. So just not useful. Uh, metrics that come with a warning from the space framework authors, such as lines of code metric, tend to measure effort or output. Okay, so effort is like inner outer loop time spent. Don't know what that means. Developer velocity index benchmark, I guess indexed against some like a uh, normal curve or something. Talent capability score, not sure. Contribution analysis. Yeah, it's probably like lines of code, number of pull requests you're in, comments, etc. Outcome and retention. I don't know what that is, but that seems meaningless as well. Okay, what's wrong with this approach? First, the only folks who care about these metrics are the people collecting them. Customers don't care. Executives don't care. Investors don't care. Second, and most crucially, collecting and evaluating these metrics hinders the measures downstream folks actually do care about like profitability. Yeah, and I think this is what we're talking about when like you got to focus on impact. It's like, what is the actual impact we want to do? And usually it's for the business, right? The reason we get paid, the reason we're here is because there's a business. And the reason the business is here is at the end of the day, the customers, for the most part, that you can't only look at customers. You also got to look at like business health. So, you know, if we're only focused on customers, we're giving it away for free. We can't do that. So it's like a little triangle, us customers, uh, the business. So looking at these things, we're saying like, like we talked about lines of code is meaningless for the customers in the business. Doing zero lines of code and a million lines of code could, could have the same impact on the customers and business. Therefore, this is not a useful metric uh, because it isn't a proxy for impact. Okay. Why is McKinsey adding ways to measure effort? One reason is that it's the easiest thing to measure, but the McKinsey approach ignores an important truth. The act of measurement changes how developers work as they try to game the system. Yeah, so one thing you could do to game lines of code, for instance, is to like use the auto formatter. Everyone's gonna say that formatting the thing is better. Like we should format it all consistently, but this could have you touching like half the code base and like throw millions of lines in there and it's just not useful, you know? Like your 1 million lines of useless stuff isn't better than my like 10 lines of like actual fixing stuff. The earlier in the cycle you measure, the easier it is to measure. Okay, and also the more likely that you introduce unintended consequences. Let's take the extreme of measuring only profits. The good news is that everyone is aligned across the company. The bad news attributing who contributed how much to the profit is nearly impossible. You can fix the attribution question by measuring outputs or effort, but the cost is that you change people's behavior as it incentivizes them to game the system to score better on those metrics. Okay, so this is true. Like if you could always do the attribution down to individual changes and get to the end 
outcome. This is a superpower, but it is not impossible. And this is actually something I will say that Meta did incredibly well that I didn't really fully appreciate until I left and looked at how uh, other orgs are doing it. And basically what they have is this ability to experiment. Any, any engineer can experiment code change. And that change is going to track. Well, I'll say that change is going to look at all the impacts and be able to track like how did different people in these buckets, you know, under the control and the test, how does that roll up into profits? And because, you know, Meta has like billions of people. So this works also only because it has like super high end population. Um, you can actually get with pretty good accuracy, like, you know, even like a 0.1%, a 1% change. And like this led to like this much more profit. I mean, so this is possible, but it's incredibly hard, right? Like they've been trying to do this for like, since they, they were created, and um, you know, spent billions of dollars, I'm sure on, on doing this, but it is possible. Um, but it's just, yeah, it is very hard for anyone not like at planet scale currently. Uh, that said, I, I am pretty excited about things like launch darkly and stuff to like try and get some of this experimentation capability into the hands of like normal people, because I really think this is a superpower. And if you can do this um, from the get go, you can solve basically everything this this article is talking about, right? Like you don't have to find stupid metrics to measure that don't do anything, just measure it on profit and anything that you find is like closely correlated with leading to profit. Okay, so this is what they're talking about, right? The easier to measure things is the things that um, are are farther away from the impact you're trying to have. So the effort uh, is like how many docs you put out, how many, I don't know, Jira tickets you create. The output is like how many PRs you're on, how many comments you make, stuff like that. Um, but the outcome is actually like, how much did this increase? How much does this feature increase people coming to the website? How much did it keep them staying on the website? Did it increase the funnel to like buying? And then the impact is like, how much did all of this lead to profits? And yeah, this is really hard to like figure out, right? Like this is like a science experiment, um, but there's so many variables. There's so many like things. There's so many different steps in the process. Like this is never just one change. It's like 10 changes uh, leads to this tiny thing. And then you got all these different customers from different backgrounds coming. And so measuring this whole thing is, is very hard. Okay, so let's take the case of a company that's reasonably profitable and in the upper quartile for the industry. The company's leadership dislikes being unable to attribute individuals' performance in contributing to profitability. Would you be tempted to screw up your company's business by introducing micromeasuring. Hell no. We urge engineering leaders to look to outcome and impact measurements to identify what to measure. It's true that it is tempting to measure effort, but there's a reason why sales and recruitment teams are not judged by their performance in being in the office at 9 a.m. sharp or by the number of emails sent, which are both effort for output. Also, by the way, if you're a company and you have 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. standups or even daily standups, I will not work for you uh, because this is actually not a very impactful thing for engineers to do. I mean, it signals to me that you haven't figured that out. I mean, so you are probably not a good engineering org and I need to stay away. So just my two cents there. So which which outcomes and impacts can be measured for engineering teams? Dora and Space give some pointers and we offer two more. Yeah, I don't like either of these. I, I never heard them before, but they seem bad. Um, I'll offer some, some other ways uh, in a second. Uh, producing at least one customer facing thing per team per week. This output might not sound so impressive, but in practice is very hard to achieve. The most productive teams and nimble companies can pull this off. Though, if you consider why a startup moves so fast and executes so well, it's because they have to do so out of necessity, even if they do not measure this. Mm, no. The reason a startup moves so fast is because it hasn't built itself into a corner yet. There, It's a green field. I can build with Legos. This is going to work. That's why it goes so fast. Um, a lot of what startups do to build fast now will not scale to build fast later. So I think giving this advice to companies that are more mature and further down the road is, is not good advice. But I will say that this idea of like producing impact every week or at least moving towards the main thing, that is so simple, but actually very impactful over time. But I wouldn't say customer facing. What I would say is impact, right? So like, yes, it's okay if it's like customer facing on the business side. It's also okay if it's just one milestone on a project that they can't use yet, but it's getting you closer to the goal. Um, but if you can keep up this cadence of at least one thing, personally, I like to keep myself to about three things every week, uh, try to do one thing a day of impact. This leads to a lot over time. And I think when you can't do this, it does lead to you needing to like investigate what's blocking you from that. And when you solve those little things, that's how you get 1% improvements over time. And that's how you keep this thing like running. Okay, delivering business impact committed to by the team. There's a good reason why impact is so prevalent at the likes of Meta, yep, super prevalent, uh, Uber and other fast moving tech companies by rewarding impact to the business incentivizes software engineers to understand the business and to prioritize helping it reach its goals. Yet, so this is impact, you know, you're understanding the business. Why do 
do we exist? What are we trying to do? How, like, what opportunities do we have? What risks do we have? Um, this is impact. And if you can do this, then you're going to be like a very valuable person to this org and honestly save yourself a lot of time because you're going to avoid a lot of like stupid projects that people say is really urgent and is actually meaningless. Is shipping a $2 million per year cost saving exercise via configuration change less valuable than shipping a 500k per year cost saving exercise that takes five engineering months? No, you don't want to focus solely on impact, but not focusing on the end goal of delivering business value is a poor choice. Sorry, what is shipping a $2 million per year cost saving exercise via a configuration change less valuable? Okay, right. Yeah. So the easy thing that you did in like two minutes that saves $2 million per year is definitely more valuable than the 500k per year that costs five engineering months. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and this one time about like impact when you start understanding the business, like you stop making just awful decisions, I think like, like everything just gets better because you actually have have like a more concrete yes no framework of like is this impactful is this thing more impactful than this other thing leads to better prioritization less wasted time um less arguments with people because you have like a ground truth of like what we're talking about and what matters i really think yeah focusing on impact is like the most important thing takeaways there's undoubtedly mounting pressure from the business and wanting to quantify the productivity of software development teams companies like mckinsey are responding to this clear demand by providing frameworks that promise to do exactly this we don't think that measuring effort and output is necessarily the answer as these come with trade-offs that will negatively impact the engineering culture. As engineering leaders, be sure to consider this trade-off and how it could change the incentives of developers. Yeah, and also I think software engineers understanding this, but the incentives in your business and what it could and should be um, can help you be more effective at your team and honestly influence your whole company to stop sucking at software engineering. So if you're interested in my tips for being a better software engineer, I just released this blog post, which I've linked below. Um, and the first one is focus on impact. Um, these are the things that I read a lot of these posts. I think about a lot of these things. I I think a lot of people get this stuff wrong. Um, so if you're interested in my take, I'll have it linked below um, and you should be able to check it out on YouTube soon as well. All right, that's it for this video. I know it's a super long one, but he writes long in-depth articles, which I tend to like. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.